customers don't phone us up to talk about kilowatt hours or whether the lights are coming on. They phone us up to talk about billing, about the amount of money we're taking off them, whether they're, we're taking the right amount, about moving house, about sharing an account with an elderly relative who, who can't manage their bills anymore or whatever it will be. Now, all of those are really, really customer centric conversations that are not about the commodity. And so I think the more that the rest of society began to understand the importance of meeting customer needs, the more energy looked quite distant from that. And I think that was what created the opportunity for companies like ours. But on the customer side, to genuinely deliver quite a differentiated offer. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Fedderson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And my guest on the show today runs one of the UK's largest energy supply businesses, having taken on the big suppliers as a startup. Uh, and on many measures, uh, things like growth, retention, awards, having won. He's one of the UK's best known and most successful entrepreneurs. He's had a long and distinguished career leading software businesses, among other types of businesses, and he studied economics at Cambridge University. My guest on the show today is Greg Jackson, founder and CEO of Octopus Energy. Uh, welcome, Greg. Hello, John. Great to have you here. Uh, quick question on your, on your background. Do you think economists make good entrepreneurs? That is a great question. Look, I think um, uh, they can do, but they need to uh, really experience the real world. For me, it was a baptism of fire when I first ran uh, a company. I, was, I think I was like, 27 years old, and we, we sold mirrors. And we had a contract with the world's biggest manufacturer of glass, which promised us the cheapest glass they would give anyone in the world. So given it's a commodity product, and we were with the world's biggest, and we got the cheapest product, we kind of never needed to go out to tender because we knew we had, in a, in a highly competitive market, uh, we knew, you know, obviously we had a great deal. And then uh, one day, a few months into the business, I was talking with the buyer at one of the big um, department store chains. And she said, you're too expensive, Greg. And I was like, we can't be. And she said, well, how much do you pay for your glass? And I told you, you know, £4.86 a metre. And she said, your rivals are paying £3.20. And I was, what? And... What it really taught me was the assumptions that you make in economics, of course, are necessary to make your models work, but they can be so far wrong as to literally destroy businesses. And so the big thing for me was the systems thinking and the understanding about how competition and supply and demand work. Uh, you know, the emerging world of behavioral microeconomics are fantastic, but you have to continually test those assumptions because they're going to be so far off the mark. That's a really good answer. And, and I find myself agreeing with a lot of it. You know, that sort of, you are trained as an economist, there are no free lunches, or that a competitive market will deliver the lowest price. You don't have to haggle with people in the world of an economics textbook, for example. Uh, but uh, reality is often somewhat different. But yeah, you know, the, the, a quantification and a very precise way of talking about scale economics, of network effects, of comparative advantage, all of these things, I think, is, is quite helpful once, once you get outside the, the, the naivety that, a, that an economics degree gives you. Well, you know, John, I think it's a bit like physics, where you, when you're learning physics at high school, um, you'll do things like you'll assume away air resistance to make the Newtonian equations work. But of course, if you assume away air resistance, cars can go at an infinite speed and planes can't fly. So just like with physics, I think economics, um, that the models are super helpful, like Newtonian mm. equations are incredibly helpful. Pretty helpful, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we then make sure we apply them in the real world because actually it's, it's, it's the places that the assumption doesn't apply that generate, for example, in business, generate opportunity. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's the, the message for me. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. 
and that other famous Cambridge economist, John Maynard Keynes, obviously had a very successful career as an investor as well as as an academic economist, although it's much much less less well known. Um, let's talk about your journey and and octopus. So, do you think the UK is a good place to start a tech business? And and if presumably it's not perfect, so you know what what bits could be better as well. Yeah, I think generally the UK is a great place to start a business. Um, you know, you can start trading immediately with any idea and almost uh, kind of test your ideas, you know, at an appropriate level of commitment along the way. I think a lot of countries, it's a lot more bureaucratic to get started, a lot more bureaucratic to register a company and, and kind of start employing people. Um, this is incredibly helpful. I think what can be difficult in the UK in tech specifically is as you get big, and you're speaking to, for example, you know, US investors, there is genuinely a mindset that you know, businesses that are going to disrupt an entire global sector come out of you know, the West Coast and possibly out of Asia. But um, I say possibly, I mean, certainly out of Asia. Uh, but you know, Europe and, and, and maybe the UK are seen as kind of feeders for that world as opposed to the ones who are going to actually drive it. Yeah, interesting. And you might, you, we, we don't have time, but you might say, you know, Deliveroo has recently IPO'd. Is that an example of investors being, you know, were, were that an American company and not, you know, scale economies aside, you know, could, could you have told the story of global dominance rather than English dominance and, and achieved a much higher multiple? Argue, you know, the, the Ubers of this world have, I, I, I suppose, arguably. Yeah, and I think also there was, you know, there was a, a, a slightly disappointing amount of kind of glee, I think, in some of the coverage of, of Deliveroo's kind of, you know, uh, the fact that price mm. dropped after their IPO. And, and, you know, you don't see that so much in the States. Mm. You know, we should be wanting companies like Deliveroo to succeed. And, and, you know, for them to have successful fundraising and IPO enables them to go on to a bigger and bigger stage globally. Yeah. And that is, you know, it's a real case in point. And, and I don't know whether delivery, what the right price is. Mm. But I think some of the attitude around it was, was kind of slightly dispiriting, actually. Yeah, that is a good point. You got some of the big insurers sort of, even before the IPO, explicitly publicly saying, we're not backing this. It was, um, yeah, <laughs> interesting. Do you have role models as business leaders? Is there anyone you, you look up to, whether you know them or not, and say, you know, if I could be more like that person or if I could emulate aspects of what they do, that'd be great. Yeah, look, I think, uh, I know it's really almost um, a, a stereotype to say it. I, I, and I wouldn't want to be like these people. But for example, I think we have got an enormous amount to learn from Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, actually. And, and, and of course, other people have built great big businesses. But I think, you know, if you look at Elon Musk, there's a couple of things I think are really interesting. The first thing is that take electric cars. Um, for at least a decade, the entire global auto industry, an enormous number of investors, um, and, and a bunch of other stakeholders were basically saying, you know, electric cars, uh, you know, are not going to happen. You know, batteries are too expensive. Um, there's not going to be consumer appetite. People don't want to have to charge a car and wait an hour or whatever it might be. And you know, the the, the vision and the incredible confidence to pursue the path that he believed in was huge. And I think with Elon, if you look at some of the interviews, there's a great TED interview with him where he's talking among other things about the boring company, the one that makes tunnels. And, and, and you discover what he's doing as always is he goes back to first principles and he thinks about um, what are the fundamentals here and working from those fundamentals, you can quite often work out, actually this opportunity is gonna disrupt a market. So for example, with electric cars, what he understood was the exponential decrease in battery costs that was going to be possible at scale, right? Um, and, and there were other things as well. But I think, you know, the confidence to go back to first principles rather than listen to people who got hooked on a current solution. And by the way, John, you opened talking about economics. Now, economics is brilliant on this. Uh, you know, you've got local minima in economics or local maxima where you get stuck on a suboptimal solution. And I think understanding that and saying that the world is stuck in a place where with the right effort, we can get over the hump to a better place. Um, and I think um, similarly, that kind of thinking back to first principles, when Elon talks about the boring company making tunnels, 
By the way, whether it works or not, the, the thought process is what matters. Um, he says, uh, look, you know, tunnels cost 10 times more than surface roads. So if we can reduce the cost of tunneling by a factor of 10, then suddenly we open up the opportunity for tunneling. And he says like, you know, uh, well, the cost of a tunnel is proportional to the square of the diameter. So if you halve the diameter, you can quarter the cost of a tunnel. Yeah. Cool, we're now only two and a half times more expensive than roads. And then he says like, you know, the cost of tunneling is proportional to the speed of the tunneling machine. And that is typically limited by thermodynamics. And actually there's room to double the speed of tunneling machines. Right, great, we're now broadly speaking the same cost as a road. And you can throw in a couple of other thoughts. Mm. And I think that thought process is, is incredibly important for us in energy, for example, where we've got to think through, you know, fundamentally, for example, can renewable electricity be cheaper for the uses consumers actually need and the businesses need that will deliver nations their solutions um, than fossil fuels faster than anyone thinks? And by the way, the answer is obviously yes. And we can talk about that later if you like. So I think Elon Musk's ability to uh, go back to first principles. Similarly with Elon Musk, you know, everyone says they're busy. Here you've got a guy who's simultaneously spending half his week disrupting the entire global auto industry, probably making the electric car revolution a decade faster, whilst doing pretty much the same in rocketry, right? And, and, and by the way, off the back of that, doing things like Starlink, which is, you know, is going to put three or four times more satellites in space for the kind of internet service than the entirety of humanity has done since Sputnik in 1957. Now, in his spare time, he then does the boring company, a couple of other things. And you've got to say, like, if any of us think we're busy, mm. we ain't scratching the surface. And he's got six or seven children or something, I think, as well. So uh, presumably that, in, in my experience is right, that keeps you pretty busy as well. Uh, it's incredible, isn't it? How do you and, think he does that? Do you, do, you think, do, you, do you think it's delegation? Is it about great deputies and delegation? Uh, well, I think, first of all, he's an expert at what he I read this great article on um, Elon Musk and said, how did he become so knowledgeable on rockets? And the answer was he read PhD papers on rocket science in order to really understand rocketry before starting SpaceX. Mm. And I think once you're truly expert, it's really interesting that you can then think and deliver much more quickly than uh, you know when, when you're having to rely upon enormous means with lots of different experts in the room. Yeah. So I think developing your own expertise mm. to the point you can make your own judgments quickly actually hugely, hugely speeds up the, the, the kind of process of innovation and, and disruption. I think, uh, you know, he famously works 100 hours a week and he says that's because in his 40-year lifetime, whatever it might be, working lifetime, he'll get done what other people would take 100 years to do. Mm. Right? I think that's pretty key. Um, and then I think there is, so I think that relentless energy is interesting. Uh, but then I think there is the bit that says, like, you know, he is expert and therefore experts want to work with him. And he surrounds himself with the very, very best in their field because, and, and we find this with our technology people, for example, you know, what attract great technology talent to a company? It's if you've already got great yeah. technology ta uh, talent running that company. So it is. If you are, you know, clever and driven and all of these things, being around people like that is uh, makes your life a lot happier in general, I think it's something that I've observed. Just how, can I relate that a, a bit to what you're doing? How has your, so, so, you know, the octopus energy is now a lot bigger than it once was, um, obviously, and that's happened very quickly. How has your role of CEO uh, evolved? And, and I suppose as it relates to delegation, expertise those those themes how have you how's it evolved and how have you managed that evolution yeah it's it's a great question i think when you first start a business it's like playing space invaders or pac-man you know you move the joystick and the, you know, the on-screen character moves it's a direct control as the business gets bigger um it becomes more like sim city where mm. you put in place the structures and then the you know the, the team kind of occupy those structures and actually make their own decisions to do stuff. From the very beginning, we set up to be a decentralized business. So, um, you know, really delegating decision-making, giving authority to people on the ground. And I think that that has really helped us scale quickly because we haven't had to kind of continue. Instead of being like a hermit crab, where you have to go and get a new shell at each stage of growth. Mm. Essentially our, our, our organizing principles have just scaled with the business. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had a fundamental reinvention, 
But what we are doing is kind of creating ever more pockets of uh, talent and people with both freedom and responsibility to deliver our vision. Mm. And so for me, you know, I've, I've been focused on culture and on the direction we're going from the beginning and making sure that everyone in the company truly understands that. They understand what we stand for, what works for us and what doesn't, and, and our fundamental beliefs as a business. And, and I think as we scale, I just have to get that into more and more people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so so related, related question then. And I think it's a common situation in a startup where you'll have great people at the start. As you grow, people tend to specialize a bit more. It sounds like the way you've done things in a more modular way, maybe maybe um, the scope of people's roles don't, doesn't change as much as it might have over time. What, what do you do in that common situation where you've got someone who was brilliant in the early days, but they haven't necessarily scaled with the with the business? You know, a, a great bookkeeper, but now you need a CFO or, 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 or something along those lines. How, how do you manage that sort of transition with your direct reports? Yeah, so there are, I think there are two parts to it. So we talk about the concept of tower craning. I don't know if you've ever seen a tower crane on a building site, how they're built, but basically the way a tower crane is built is um, it starts off with one unit, kind of, you know, this one vertical unit, and, it, and they clip the, the lifting device onto it, and it climbs yeah. up to the top of that unit. It then grabs another unit, pulls it in, clips it into the center, rides itself above that, pulls in another unit, clips it into the center, rides itself above that. So they kind of continually elevate themselves. And so we talk with our team very consciously that their job is to tower crane, that is to elevate themselves, backfilling with new team members. Um, mm-hmm. But for those whose, whose talents, for example, might be you know not necessarily tower craning all the way, but at some point on the way, then the great thing about the way we grow is we're continually creating new enterprises and, and new opportunities that are perfect for them. And, and actually, you know what? One of the interesting things is I think a lot of companies suffer because they, as they grow, they bring in senior people mm. who have spent 20 years learning one way of doing things. And when you bring them into a truly disruptive company, actually half the time, most of what they know is not helpful. Yeah. Here, what, and, and particularly when you bring them into a new enterprise within a, you know, a, a new initiative within a company like ours. And, and so I think having grown a lot of people now from the beginning who can take on the challenge in our business at any level, whether it be a micro opportunity, a micro business for a new opportunity, or indeed, you know, running a, a large division or running, for example, a migration of the entire Eon and Empower customer base. We've kind of grown these people in the organization. And so far, I think one of the privileges of growth um, is you're keeping finding opportunities for your people. Yeah. It will be hard if we slow down, so we better keep going. Yeah. Yeah, no, I told you, there is a huge virtue in momentum uh, when you're when you're building a business, not least not least of which is um, creating opportunities for people to take on responsibility. It, very interesting. What was the it, it, you know from the outside? It looks like it's all been smooth sailing, just this spectacular rise. But presumably, there there's there there were moments along the way. Even now, you probably look back and go, you know, what, you know, make you make you feel sick in the stomach just to think about particular instances in the growth of the business. What was the most difficult time for you? Is there is there a particular point, a particular meeting, a particular you know moment where you, where you just thought, oh my god, we're in we're in big trouble here? You know, I I actually hate this question because um, I can't think of any, which okay, even well, means okay. we've still got them to come. Or on an optimistic <laughs> level, um, you know, we, we handled them well. And I think, you know, I did once learn in a small business, it's a great moment when there was some disaster going on. One of our senior managers kind of was being told about it. And instead of kind of looking stressed, he smiled and said, it'll be fine. And then when the person who told him about it left the room, I said, how's that going to be fine? He said, I've no idea, but there's no point stressing everyone. Mm. And then of course he sorted it all out and it was fine. And I think, you know, there is that thing where, if we've got our eye on a big picture, um, even things that could be calamitous in uh, in another world, it's all going to be all right because we're looking a long way into the distance of what we want to create. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, there was. A, it feels like, and I don't quite know the the genesis story here, but fr- from the start, you have been you know you've been partnered with Octopus Investments as a as as a sort of financial backing for this 
for this company. That wasn't the way a lot of the, you know, the supply, the sort of upstart supply businesses went in the UK. They bootstrapped, they they you know, benefited from from billing customers in advance, then growing a business off the back of that. Was that a deliberate decision by you? And 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 what was the rationale? Has it has it been borne out? Yeah, it was. It was very deliberate. And um when we first the, the, my co-founders and I previously built businesses that built technology platforms. And uh, when we sold one of those businesses, we decided that, you know, energy looked like a, an area that we could use technology to kind of drive a totally different operating model, bring costs down for the benefit of consumers, and also use technology to help drive towards a, a sort of, you know, a green system faster. But the, um, uh, we found a team from London Business School uh, to help us write the business plan. And uh, they were brilliant. And at the end of it, it suggested that if we wanted to be really confident that we were going to be able to get this thing off the ground rapidly and, and to be able to handle hiccups in the market, we needed 10 million pounds of investment. And although we were quite, you know, we got a moderately good track record as, on, as entrepreneurs in tech, the idea of raising 10 million quid off the back of a PowerPoint for a business in a sector we'd never touched before was a little bit daunting. So we didn't, we, we did other things. And then I was introduced to Simon Rogerson a few years later. He's the founder and the CEO of Octopus Investments. Mm. And uh, we had a cup of tea. And um, at the end of it, he asked if I'd be interested in being a non-exec director of Octopus Investments. And I said, well, actually, no, <laughs> because I, you know, I prefer running businesses than, than, than being in that place. Uh, but I do have a business I'd love to run that I think you should back. And because Octopus Investments have got this like, you know, multi-billion pound investment in renewable generation. Yeah. And it also owns one of the best venture capital firms in London. Mm-hmm. Being able to kind of work with them with our disruptive venture capital style idea in energy, I couldn't imagine a better backer. Anyway, mm-hmm. Simon loved the idea. And I think it was as little as five or six weeks from the moment we first met to shaking hands on the deal. Wow. And, and they've been incredible backers ever since. The, the UK supplier space has obviously evolved a lot uh, over the last five to 10 years. We used to be in a world where the big six were well known. We had less than 12 suppliers. It, it occurs to me that a big driver of that change has actually been government intervention uh, in the sense that if you're a, as I understand, if you're a supplier, you've got less than, than a certain number of customers. Uh, you avoid some of the obligations that are imposed upon companies with with uh, with more customers there's a sort of differential treatment based on based on scale to drive smaller participants into the market it clearly worked i think we got up to 60 or 70 uh, suppliers over time um, arguably too many in um, and 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 you know it wasn't a wasn't a bad bet to, to make to go in and, and and see which way the market went uh, and 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 you know the cost of entry was low how important do you think that policy was in the formation of the current UK energy supply market that we have now? And do you think do you think we need those sorts of policies moving into the future? So I think it's great that you know you have a market where um, new companies can enter with new ideas, but I don't think that the kind of concepts that you described there were particularly helpful. So. For example, uh, it's really all grounded in this kind of muddle-headed wrong view of energy supply or energy retail, uh, that it it is a sort of a Chicago school rational consumer who's going to enter the market and based upon their view of current and future energy prices, lock into a one-year contract with a supplier and do that every year. And that you're going to have suppliers who are kind of, you know, entering into an auction of that consumer's business based on the current wholesale market. Uh, it's fundamentally flawed. I mean, first of all, by the way, no one knows what, knows what future prices are going to do. Um, so, you know, there's never a point at which someone can make a rational view on, you know, whether or not it's a good idea to enter into a one-year contract right now. Um, but the second thing, far more importantly, is um, consumers don't want that. You know, we don't want that in any market. We want the reassurance that we're going to get good value and good service day in, day out, rather than being in an adversarial situation. And, and so I think these, the concept of, the, of having lots of suppliers, you know, each bidding based on this kind of, you know, price model is uh, it creates stress and ultimately alienation, you know, kind of uh, disengagement for consumers. And it's much more like um, you know, the model that that was creating or would have created looks like the souk, you know, where um, 
you've got all these traders each telling you they're going to be the cheapest, but there's always a sting in the tail because it's the only way they're going to make money. And then you get all these intermediaries, you know, the bloke that hangs around on the edge of the suit that promises going to get you a deal, but actually just takes you off to his mate who gives him a backhanded commission. You know, that was the energy market. We were, not we as Oxfus, but, but the UK was creating. Mm. And, then, and I don't think it's the one that people want. What we want is one in which companies' reputation is absolutely paramount based upon are they bringing long-term good value, reliably, with great service to consumers. Now, that is a market in which you get higher quality investors, you get more engaged customers, um, and you get better long-term outcomes. Now, that's the market we want. And I think in order to get that, we definitely needed to enable new entrants. Companies like Octopus, uh, maybe Bulb or Ovo, and a few others that maybe had a long-term view of the value they could bring to consumers. And it is great we had that easy entry, but it is you know, really unfortunate it was predicated around the model you've described. And of course, that's why so many companies have gone bust. It's why so many customers still think energy is a market they get ripped off in, which is outrageous given how important this market is. It should be a high-trust market, not a low-trust market. Uh, very interesting, Greg, and I entirely agree around the virtues of a, a, a trust-based energy market. Do you have a sense of, uh, look, and I think the failings of the major energy suppliers f- five, six, seven, eight years ago are well documented, uh, you know, yeah, loyalty penalties, uh, lack of trust, all of those things. Do you know why that happened? You know, we had we had a dozen, you know, we probably had a dozen suppliers in the market. To me, that feels like it should be competitive. Why why wasn't it working? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, first of all, it's quite an opaque market. Um, you know, at Tesco, if I buy a dozen items, the till receipt is an inch long and I can instantly understand it. Um, yeah, in energy, I buy two products and every month or maybe every quarter, you know, I get a two-page PDF with probably 100 different numbers on it. So it's very easy for companies to make short-term profits by hoodwinking customers. And, um, you know, you then had uh, an investor base that quite enjoyed um, you know, very profitable returns and putting pressure on management to do more every year. Um, and so eventually you get and have a greater kind of um, separation between the, the interest of the customer and, you know, what the company is trying to do. And I think that's when you start to see lots of regulatory invention, uh, intervention. And at that point, companies become very focused on the regulator rather than the customer. And, um, you know, the regulator tries to act as a proxy for customers. But the problem with that is that, you know, customers are a heterogeneous bunch. And in trying to meet the needs of, all of the customers, the regulator, uh, regulator ends up often kind of creating this lowest common denominator and companies are focused on that rather than the customer. I think also energy companies traditionally saw, uh, you know, their job was generation, transmission, uh, engineering of, you know, kind of gas and extraction and pipes. Um, mm. and, and customers were merely the off taker, um, you know, back to days when energy was, was run by local government and the state so i think for all those reasons both culturally and in terms of the financial structures of energy customers were not well understood and not you know the business were not built around the idea of serving the customer and you can kind of get away with that in a commodity market now if you're saying that basically the only job in energy is to switch the lights on when someone wants it that's that's kind of okay but actually energy isn't you know customers don't find us up to talk about kilowatt hours or um you know whether the lights are coming on. They phone us up to talk about um, billing, about the amount of money we're taking off them, whether they're, we're taking the right amount, um, you know, about moving house, uh, about sharing an account with an elderly relative who, who can't manage their bills anymore or whatever it will be. Now, all of those are really, really customer-centric conversations that are not about the commodity. And so I think the more that the rest of society began to understand, understand the importance of meeting customer needs, the more energy looked quite distant from that. And I think that was what created the opportunity for companies like ours on the customer side. There's other things we do, but on the customer side to genuinely deliver quite a differentiated offer. Um, and, I th- and I think, you know, you're now going to have catch up as, as, as the traditional energy companies try and bring in more and more customer centric people to senior management that kind of understand what it is that customers need and want from a business. Mm. 
Do you think there's a, do you see gener like I, 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 to, to me, to some extent, this is sort of behavioral and psychological, right? If you grew up in a, you know, if you grew up where the government was the only supplier of energy and energy markets weren't deliberate, weren't liberalized or deregulated, you don't think that much about switching your energy supply. You kind of just take what the, what the, you know, what's, what's offered to you in a sense. And, 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 you know, loyal, you know, I suppose you shouldn't be surprised in a privatized market that loyalty tariffs arise. Do you see differential behavior based on the, based on your know, age of your customers? Um, not really, actually. I think interesting. what's interesting is customers work in many markets. So, you know, regardless of age, they used to be able to choose where they do their shopping, um, you know, where they uh, bank, uh, where they, um, you know, get their broadband or Sky TV or whatever it be from. And, and so I think in energy, similarly, uh, regardless of age, um, you know, there's a high degree of, certainly for us as a company, it might be different across some of the companies, but there's a high degree of demand for outstanding customer service. And they really hold us to account. And, and on the age thing, I mean, a good example would be, I think, on the whole, people who subscribe to which magazine, you know, the kind of Consumer Association, mm. um, are, are typically older and demand outstanding service. And, and, you know, because they see us recommended by which they hold us to incredibly high standards. Yeah. Interesting, and and Octopus, of course, won a bunch of which awards. I think over the over the over the last few few years, from recollection. That's right. Um, okay, one thing that strikes me about your business model. So, so you you, you you're reasonably famous for offering a tariff that uh, that you know is passes through the wholesale price. You know, if it goes up and down. You're not you're not committing someone to a one year hedge or a two year hedge. You're just saying that we will give you what the what the wholesale price is. Um, but you've capped it, right? You haven't said, and you know, wholesale prices in this country and in the UK can get up to uh, six thousand pounds a megawatt hour. I, I think at the moment uh, they can get up higher. Why did you? Uh, why did you, on the one hand, say we're going to we're going to give you this flexible type pricing, uh, where you know if the price goes down, we'll pass that through to you, but at the same time, decide to cap the absolute peaks. Yeah, it was actually a conversation with a journalist. We launched our first tracker tariff, which is a daily tracker. Um, quite some time ago. And the journalist said to me, well, what happens if you know, prices get spiky? And I said, we've modeled it. You know, um, uh, In the long run, customers will still be better off. And she said, totally get that. But you know, what about in the short run? And I thought it was a really good observation. So when we launched the half hourly track of the Agile Tariff, we built um, a protection in. And I think that's there for a couple of reasons. The first is, the reason to have the dynamic pricing, uh, there, are, there are two reasons, I think. The first is, we set the formula, we publish the formula. There is absolutely no way that we can hoodwink a consumer. So earlier on, I talked about the importance of trust. And that's kind of the ultimate trust, right? We just put it out there and we cannot control that price. Um, so I think the second thing is that, you know, to make the most of renewables, you want to be able to grab green electrons when they're abundant, when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining increasingly we've got things like electric cars or hopefully decarbonized heating where you've got a big shiftable discretionary load and if you're going to get people to do that you need them to respond to the price signal um uh, now by the way that may not be sort of a manual decision it can be automatic right you know your car connects to our tariff and knows when to optimize so you don't need to think about it but um uh, you can achieve that um uh degree of shifting without exposing people to bonkers high prices. Um, it's a bit like the carrier bag tax in, in, in retail. You know, they introduce a 10p charge when you take a, a plastic bag and the demand for plastic bags dropped 90%. Now, 10 pence isn't a lot of money, but it changes behavior. So I think on these time of use tariffs, um, you definitely don't need to have torturously high pricing. You just need to have enough variability that um, you know, people want to react to it, and and uh, you know we're in a much better place to model and either use a financial instrument or our own balance sheet to handle the occasional very high spike. So you yeah. know, recognizing the asymmetry of information between us and the consumer, um, I think it is economically rational for us and only fair for us to kind of you know protect them from from times of, of really high spikes. And then, you know, 
we can spread that over a long period of time. We model it and we've got the balance sheet for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those obvious common sense points that, again, the, the economics graduate may not necessarily realize on first on, on first glance, but um, a good good example recently was Texas, obviously, where I know you're you're active. There's a company called Gritty that was that was just doing the full cost pass through. And, and you know, it seems sensible until you start seeing sort of newspaper articles of, you know, army veterans getting ten thousand dollar bills for for a week's worth of power that you say, well, some, something didn't quite work in this offering. It just doesn't quite pass that that common sense, common sense test. No, you're right. And I think actually what we saw in Texas was really a failure of the centrally planned approach to an energy market. Um, and customers, you know, although there's gritty customers, obviously it's totally unacceptable to be passing on such cost to a consumer. And it's a shame that they didn't cap it. But um, I think it really shines a light on what's going on in the background of energy and uh, enables the world to see that, you know, the structure that had been created by the, you know, um, uh, essentially some, you know, governmental actors wasn't able to handle extreme events. And I think something we talk about a lot is we need a more decentralized, more market oriented approach in energy, because although that was you know, a very clear extreme event, um, what we, um, you know, what we know as energy market participants is the system is full of waste and of, of money going you know, to the wrong place if the outcomes we want are a low cost transition to net zero. Mm, yes. Well, I won't, that, that's a, that's a rabbit warren that, that, that around, um, you know, market design and these types of things. I mean, you, you might say, you know, any generator that wasn't on during those Texas storms was foregoing nine grand a, a, me, a megawatt hour at the time. There's a reasonable market signal there to, 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 to be on, but of course the sort of all of the machinery around the price and, and the market clearly, clearly didn't function but that's I'll, I'll leave that as a as a discussion point for for, for another day and, and there's a lot of very good thinking in this country going on around market design and, and how you can make the most of, of price signals um do you but but just one br one brief additional question on that so it, it sounds like you know octopus has this reputation for uh, you know, scarcity pricing, and you know, charge a car when the wind's blowing, and turn off the turn off the heater when the when it's peak periods or what, whatever it is. Do you think prices need to play a similar role in generation and investment? You know, where assets are built, how they're maintained, which technology gets gets built. Do you see a similar sort of role for prices in 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 guiding investment decisions on the generation side? I totally do. You know, um, earlier on, you talked about the founding story of Octopus Energy. One of the observations for me was uh, when we used to build energy, uh, sorry, uh, technology platforms in other sectors, one of the key signs that a sector was ripe for disruption was when people in the sector said, um, it's not going to happen in our sector. Our sector is different. And, you know, I had, uh, we had a client, it was a clothing retailer, said clothes will never go online because people need to try them on. Well, today, you know, clothes have gone very much online. And we saw the same in lots of sectors. I think with energy, every time I hear energy is different, mm -hmm. it tells me there is um, you know, the opportunity to make energy better for consumers and citizens by challenging that. And so in the case of where generation goes, I, do, I don't understand why it isn't a pure market function now. After all, we, the government don't decide you know, which fields are going to be used for what crops. They don't decide where we're going to grow potatoes and you know, kind of what breed of potatoes, we trust the market to manage pretty much every other sector. And by the way, Stalin did try deciding which crops would be grown where. Mm. And I think there's some failures with, you know, yeah, trying to grow wheat in climates. Well. You know, it doesn't work, right? And I think, you know, God's plan was the central, the Soviet Central Planning Committee for, for you know, the economy. And the abandonment of God's plan was really, the, you know, sort of the end of the, the Soviet era. And I think, I don't understand why we still have central planning in energy. Hmm. If if I would have ventured, so I, I I entirely agree with you, Greg. And I, I I you know we've given government the chance to work out you know how how much capacity to build under the CGB, and they got it wo woefully wrong. And all they had to do was work out how many gigawatts we needed. And now we're asking them to 
work out which technology and where it's located. And, I, you know, I don't, I, 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 the government hasn't instilled enough faith or the bureaucracy hasn't instilled enough faith in me that it, that it can do that. But I, I think part of this is, is sort of how you conceptualize the energy system, right? So, this debate normally goes, you know, people like people like yourself, uh, Guy New New Energy Systems Catapult, others, and and his colleague George Taylor. You know, why shouldn't this be a market? Who, who in a central organisation could possibly envisage what should be built and where, and you know, God's plan and and the crops failed and all that sort of stuff. On the other hand, you have people saying the world is. They're saying it's a war. This is a war, and at war you nationalise everything. Uh, you know, the, the, we need to get the spitfires in the air. The world is burning. Let's get moving. CFDs, low cost of capital, just build the stuff. And, and I think a lot of it comes down to how you conceptualize the role of the power system at the moment. I don't, I don't know if you've got thoughts on, on that, but at least that yeah, do, yeah. occurs to me that's a sort of framing. That, that's the framework by which I can understand the idea behind, uh, you know, a central planning of the, of, of the energy system. They say there are technologies that, that aren't yet at scale, hydrogen and various things, and they need a big push and they need a very firm hand and we can't trust the market to do this. Look, the way that we conceptualise an energy is it's like, uh, any other sector it only exists like the only reason we have an energy sector is because there are people who want to use energy uh, households and businesses and like any other sector there are a bunch of companies who have arisen whose job it is to deliver uh, that product that service to those customers and um, uh, you know for example we have about a 2.2 million household customers in the UK and we've got to meet their energy needs we are going to be pretty good at finding the ways of meeting those needs. And we're highly incentivized to do so in an efficient way. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to be uh, thinking about how our customers use it. So, for example, are they buying electric vehicles? If they're buying electric vehicles, how comfortable are they handing over the job of charging to us? Or do they want to override it and so on? All these questions about how these are. And particularly when we move into to heating and decarbonized heating, you know, what is going to be the solution that meets their heating needs uh, in a way that makes them happy? Now, companies can compete on who can better meet those needs, better understand them, drive down the price of them um, by each company kind of thinking through the challenge, uh, working hard on its own solutions, making its own bets with its own capital. And the companies that get the bets are right win more than the companies that get the bets wrong and they attract more of the capital and they grow. But companies will also be watching each other and each identifying bits of the solution they can bring together um, you know, from, from looking at what their rivals are doing from more efficient and better ways of meeting those consumer needs at lowest possible cost. It's what happens in, for example, retail. And I think, um, uh, you know, if the government have got a role to play, it's largely in saying things like, you know, You've got to be zero carbon by a certain year and then let companies compete for the best solution to that problem. And using you know, the magic of the market is we take all of the complexity of different behaviors, different uses, different ways of charging, different ways of talking to consumers, different ways of generating, different ways of storing, uh, different ways of balancing between demand side and storage and all those questions. And we, can, we bring all of that together into the economic bundle of a company. And then those companies competing. Now, you know, what, what the, the maths on SpaceX are astonishing. Um, I think they launched a rocket for 18 times less than NASA. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think when you look at a sector, very often the, so the, the, the fans of central planning think that the economy of scale or their ability to generate insights is going to produce the lowest cost solution. But as soon as you open up and look at what other people can achieve, you see these enormous great gaps. So just one, one interesting stat for me, right? Um, when two litres of milk leaves a farm in the UK, it costs about 70 pence. Mm. And by the time it is in the supermarket, it costs about one pound and nine. So it's gone up by about 50% between the farm gate and the consumer. And to get there, it's had to be shipped around in trucks. It's a bulky product. The trucks are refrigerated. It's going to go in expensive refrigerated storage. It's got to be bottled. And it's perishable, so it's not going to last long. And all of that, people driving trucks up and down motorways and emptying lorries, 
is done for adding about 50% to the commodity cost. With electricity, it leaves the wind farm or the solar farm or wherever else uh, about four and a half pence a kilowatt hour. And by the time it's at the consumer, it's costing something like three and a half times that. And yet it's just gone through static wires. It's not having expensive trucks driving it everywhere. Now, how have we got an energy system that is so astonishingly inefficient that the cost of getting the electrons to the consumer is roughly three and a half times the cost of the electrons themselves? Now, um, uh, that to me is the opportunity for us to really start competing down through heterogeneous solutions, um, which is not what you see in a, in a central yeah. planned market. And I think yeah. the last bit on that then is, you know, this is only going to get worse as we move to renewables and we have incredibly expensive centrally designed solutions like you know, where we're going to build storage, what kind of storage that's going to be. So I guess our view of it is I'd love to build my own wind farms and, you know, solar farms and a cable to Iceland or whatever it be to bring in the energy to meet our customers' needs, to shift around our customers' demand to better match that generation. I think Octopus will be good at that. So we could have lower cost offers for customers and then, uh, you know, work out where we need storage, whether it be in the house at the end of the street, in the substation or, you know, at the point of generation um, to have the most efficiently balanced system and compete against other companies who use a different, you know, array of solutions. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. And one of the things that so it sounds like you're, you're saying you can still mandate the objective, whatever it is, decarbonization without having a heavy hand on, on the, on the way it's actually delivered. Whereas it seems historically, at least in the power sector, that the two have gone hand in hand, you, um, you have the objective and then you, and then you kind of force it, force it through. Um, That's what we do in, in employment, isn't it? Like the employment market, the government decide, doesn't decide what jobs are going to go where. It just says, look, there's a minimum wage, there's some standards of employment, you know, rules about health and safety, and then they let companies get on with it. Yeah, the central bank might might target, you know, to have some objectives around what full employment looks like, but the, you know, it's a it's a very hands off approach to managing this. Yeah, okay, I, and I, I, you know, I, you know, the 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 economists targeting rule is is you know front front of my mind. If you've got one one externality like climate change, then having one solution to it, like a carbon tax or a, or, a, or a clean energy mandate is at least in a textbook, the most efficient way of, of, of going about it. So I've got great sympathy for that idea. Um, let, let's just try, I'd like to punch through a few things around the economics of your sector quickly, uh, cognizant we're running low on time. What, what gives you the confidence that um, power supply, power retail is globally scalable? Uh, and, you know, my, my take, you know, historically, we had national champions, uh, you know, in all these spades, British Gas here, you know, um, NL in, in, in Italy, um, uh, EDF in, in France. What makes you think your business can scale globally across a whole bunch of different markets? There are two bits. So first of all is that um, fundamentally the technology that makes energy cheap in the UK with great service can make it cheap with great service in other countries. Yeah. Uh, the That's your software. One, yeah, That's software our software. That, yeah, yeah, our platform Kraken, um, and and by the way, every aspect of that, you know, kind of has large reapplication everywhere. So, you know, what is a good consumer journey for signing up for an energy account, for seeing what your bills are, for paying them, for talking to a company? All of those business processes are essentially, if you're doing a great job of them in one country with the software, chances are it's going to be very similar in others. Um, and you see that with Uber, right? I mean, and is it a scale game? I mean, is it a? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, is it super expensive to build a Kraken, or are there going to be, um, you know, 20, 20 Krakens? Yeah, I mean, there might be more than one. Yeah. Um, although only one of them will be Kraken. But the, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, software and, and and technology are brutally hard. Um, you know, there are not many oracles, right? Um, there are not many Microsoft offices. Yeah. Uh, the ability to create flexible software that can meet a wide range of needs very, very efficiently is, is challenging. Um, and it's a real scale business because yeah. uh, Kraken is updated 40 times a day at the moment. Um, you know, this is this relentless change to improve it for customers, improve it for the team that are using it and bring new capabilities to help drive that zero. Speaking of which, the second reason I think energy retail should be, you know, you should be able to have any global energy retail business is uh, as we're facing the 
challenge of moving to renewables as quickly as possible. Generation's changing, but consumption's changing, electric vehicles, electric heating and so on. And so I think um, as you're building uh, the products, services, customer experiences and technologies that enable that, be able to reapply them into multiple countries very, very quickly, helps countries decarbonize fast, rather than each country kind of creating its own solution, discovering the same issues and the same errors and going through the learning loop. You know, so if you can learn something in one country and redeploy it in another the next day, you're going to help speed up that transition. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. And, and, and okay. And, but I suppose you need to be able to find markets that are liberalized. Um, not, not all markets will, will be. Um, some will have existing monopolies, but, but but I suppose the premise is there are enough liberalized supply markets out there that you, you're going to be busy for the next few years. Yeah, I think there are two parts. So with their sort of our full stack technology plus retail, then we can you know move into liberalized markets with, with pretty much the same solution in any country. Um, but in monopoly markets, whether that be private monopolies or, or states, the technology can still be licensed by those uh, yeah. monopoly providers. And then they get immediate access to the kind of learnings I was talking about. Great. Okay, so so I, I, I need to bring it to a close now, but before we do, I'd just like to ask you about a few concepts in the energy transition and ask you if you think they're over or underrated. You can answer with one word, you can answer <laughs> with many, 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 many words. So I've got a few here. So the first one is, the role of luck in startup business success. Do you think it's overrated or underrated? Uh, it's underrated, but you've got to remember it's a repeated game. So, you know, if you're unlucky, try again. Keep going until you get lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second, the impact of the ESG, environmental social go governance movement, on deployment of capital now in the energy system. Overrated or underrated? Both. So... Uh, first of all, uh, overrated in the um, disinvestment from you know, things like uh, carbon intense industries is not going to kill those industries. You know, after all, uh, tobacco has provided some of the best returns in public markets for the last two or three decades. Mm -hmm. um, but um, underrated in that increasingly large investors are looking to deploy big sums into uh, businesses which are helping drive the transition. And I think that's a huge opportunity for companies that want to do good stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, third, the role of direct consumer choice rather than through governmental policy. So, you know, I want to go green uh, just because it, it, it's a virtuous thing to do uh, in driving the energy transition. So do you think the role of direct consumer choice in driving the energy transition is overrated or underrated? Overrated. The majority of customers repeatedly in our research um, won't pay a premium yeah. for green energy. They want cheap power, good customer service, someone they can trust, uh, yeah. all of those and, things. And they'd like it to be green, but not if it costs more. Okay, good. And the final one, to which I think I know the answer, the role of markets in achieving net zero power systems, overrated or underrated? <laughs> Massively underrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allow that, the you, innovation. <laughs> You've effectively made that point today, Greg. So good. I'm glad I knew the answer to that one. Um, wonderful. Well, I think that's a natural time to finish. Uh, it was a total pleasure, Greg. Brilliant to hear your unique perspective, uh, both as a business founder and as someone who just clearly knows this industry extremely well. So Greg Jackson, thanks so much for taking the time to speak. Uh, thanks, John. And, um, you know, uh, I can't wait to uh, meet you and talk about both economics and energy at Great Lake. <laughs> Very good. Looking forward to it. That was John Fedderson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, talking to Greg Jackson, founder and CEO of Octopus Energy. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.